the sun, the moon, the planets and stars have always fired our imaginations and fueled our mythologies. And studying the heavens, astronomy, is surely the oldest scientific discipline there is. What's really unexpected, I guess, is that astronomy has repaid our interest in it over the centuries. Time after time, it's been the place where new ideas have emerged, and it's often led the rest of the sciences. I'm a professor of physics at the University of Surrey, and the ideas and theories of the great European scientists like Galileo, Newton and Einstein lie at the heart of my work. But there's another side to me. I'm half Iraqi, and I'm keen to investigate stories I'd heard as a schoolboy in Baghdad of great astronomers from the medieval Islamic world whose work shapes the discoveries of these later Western scientists. So I'm going on a journey through Syria and Egypt to the remote mountains in northern Iran to discover how the work of these Islamic astronomers had dramatic and far-reaching consequences. There I'll discover how they were the first to attack seemingly unshakable Greek ideas about how the heavenly bodies move around the earth. It was Islam that paved the way for one of the greatest upheavals in the history of science. This is the University of Padua in northern Italy. I'm here to see incontrovertible evidence that one of the greatest breakthroughs in European science links back to the earlier work by Islamic scholars. Uh, because it was a news one that at that time... Astronomer Dr. Luisa Pigiotti and I are climbing up to the 18th century observatory. At the top, she promises to show me one of the most important books in scientific history. So, what do we have here? Okay, this is the second edition of uh, ah, the Revolution. Copernicus. Yes. This is De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium, which was published in 1543 by the Polish astronomer Nicholas Copernicus. I'll be careful. Is it this second? The significance of this book is enormous. In it, Copernicus argues for the first time since Greek antiquity that all the planets, including the Earth, go around the Sun. For thousands of years, everyone had believed a very different view, that the Earth is static and everything, including the stars, Sun and planets, move around it. And here there are all his system, okay. Oh, there we go. And just Sol, and the system. The sun okay. in the it's middle. It's a famous um, drawing. Yes. This one. <laughs> oh yes, and there's yes, yeah, there's Terra. With the moon. Yeah, with the moon with going the moon. around it. Okay. Yes. This is an astonishing book, and many historians credit it with starting the European scientific revolution. The first crucial step in a journey that led to modern physics. Well, I agree. But it does seem a bit odd that one doesn't hear much about where Copernicus got his ideas and information. The impression is that they came out of nowhere. The bikini? The bikini is all in now. It certainly is a real revelation to me that he explicitly mentions a 9th century Muslim for providing him with a great deal of observational data, an astronomer who lived in Damascus called El Batani. Like all the great scientists of the Islamic Empire, El Batani lived in a culture without portraiture. All we have are later impressions of what he might have looked like. And uh, here he mentioned 
uh, Ipakos, uh, Calippo, Ptolemy, and so on, and he started to mention what uh, he called Marcometto Saratensis and means Albatani. Okay. Yeah. And then the second book here. And the second book is, uh, oh, uh, we can look at the beginning in Latin. I see, we can open it. Copernicus, in fact, made extensive use of Elbertani's observations of the positions of planets, the sun, the moon, and stars. He worked with Latin translations, similar to this one, of the Syrian astronomer's data. So this is Bertani's Zij, is his, his yes. book of star charts. So it has the Arabic... Yes, all the Arabic, the Arabic uh, treatise, side, yes. yes, and then the Latin version. That's convenient. Ah, but he certainly, he had the data, the observational data by Albatani. And you know, uh, uh, he And Copernicus's was... book is full of clues that hints at other past sources. And though Albatani is the only Islamic astronomer Copernicus actually names, recent detective work has uncovered clues that Copernicus based many of his ideas on the work of other Islamic scholars. The clearest example is Copernicus's use of a mathematical idea devised by the 13th century Islamic astronomer Al Tusi, called the Tusi couple. Back in England, I compared a copy of Al Tusi's Tedkirafi Ilmil Hayah with another edition of Copernicus's Revolutionibus. In it, there's a diagram of the Tusi couple, and there's an almost identical diagram in Copernicus's book, even down to the letters that mark the points on the circles. So in El Tusi, there's the Arabic Elif, which is A. There's the Ba, which is B. Jim over here is the G. And the Dal at the center, D. It's a remarkable similarity. Now, this might just be coincidence, but it's pretty compelling evidence. In fact, I truly believe that Copernicus must have been aware of Altuzzi's work and other Islamic astronomers. Further detective work also shows that Copernicus used mathematical ideas for planetary motion that are remarkably similar to ones developed by another Islamic astronomer, a 14th century Syrian called Ibn Shatr. For some historians, this cannot be coincidence. Copernicus, to me, I have no proof. Eh? I don't have a smoking gun. But to me, it looked like, and again, by analyzing his own words, it looks like he was working from diagrams. Somebody gave him a, a geometric diagram of what was done by Ibn Shatr to solve the problem of the moon, for example, to solve the problem of the upper planets, to solve the problem of the movement of Mercury. He had diagrams, and he was genius enough to be able to figure out from the diagrams what was the underlying theory behind those diagrams. So, far from emerging from nowhere, it seems Copernicus's work will be better described as the culmination of the preceding 500 years of Islamic astronomy. I wanted to investigate this story, find out more about those astronomers and their ideas. But before that, I wanted to investigate an even deeper question. What actually motivated medieval Islamic scholars' interest in astronomy? This is the Umayyad Mosque in the heart of the Syrian capital, Damascus, and is one of the oldest in the world. And I'm here on a kind of treasure hunt. Well, uh, it says in the books that there is a sundial on the top of the Arus minaret, the bride minaret over there. So we'll see whether it is there or not. So that is, that this is Dr. Reem Turkmani an astrophysicist and medieval astronomy expert from Imperial College London. And we're looking for one of the most accurate sundials made in the medieval world. 